Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is Breaking the Hollywood Mold, Finding Success on YouTube and Beyond, presented by Adobe and Red Giant. Um, we have some incredibly talented panelists here today who are true pioneers in this new world of online video. Uh, my name is Dave Warner. I'm a designer at Adobe as part of our uh, video and animation teams. My day job is user interface design, um, but I still love to make videos under my YouTube uh, channel, OK Samurai. So here's a quick look at some of the stuff I've done as OK Samurai. So our first panelist is Ryan Connolly. After finishing film school and running the video studio at Alienware, rather than following the typical path of many aspiring filmmakers, he instead created Film Riot, an online show that would let him share how-to filmmaking tips, get feedback on his work, and ultimately build an audience and a community. Today, his renegade style has earned him a loyal online following of over half a million, and his company, Triune Films, continues to produce weekly online video content like Film Riot and Variant, as well as short films such as the successful Tell, Losses, Proximity, and his most recent, UFO Yeah. Here's a look at Ryan's work. Here's Triune mm -hmm. Films. Ready, and action! Hey, I am talking about love. Somebody order a pizza? Is that it? <laughs> And that's a wrap on Ed. <laughs> this is Ryan. <laughs> Just to confuse you, Ryan. Mix it up. Um, our next two panelists down there are Sam Gorski and Nico Peringer, who in 2009 created Corridor Digital, a small production studio based in Los Angeles, California. Corridor specializes, specializes in action, sci-fi, comedy, and music-related content with an emphasis on cutting-edge visual effects and professional video production quality, as evident with their hits like Dubstep Guns and Superman with a GoPro. Currently, Corridor places most of its focus into online viral video content through developing anything from short-form parodies to long-form dramatic narratives. This is Corridor Digital. We're Corridor Digital. You want to see awesome videos and we want to make them. And now here's some explosions.
our final panelist sitting next to me is Seth Worley. Uh, Seth is the resident filmmaker at Red Giant <coughs> and the director and writer of short films, branded content, and commercials for clients like J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot Productions, Leo Burnett, Steve Taylor and the Perfect Foil, and more. His short films, which include the Webby Award-winning uh, Plot Device, an Old New, Tempo, Spy vs. Guy, Form 17, and Order Up, have been featured in Forbes, USA Today, The Hollywood Reporter, Fast Company, Slate, io9, Slash Film, Mashable, and more. Seth lives and works in Nashville, Tennessee, and here's a look at some of Seth's work with Red Giant. Cool, so thank you guys so much. So first, let's just see, how did you guys get started, um, and how did you, when did you first realize that creating online videos was a viable career path? Uh, Ryan, you want to start off things off? Sure, yeah, I got uh, my start, I was working at Alienware, which is the gaming division for Dell running their video studio, and uh, you know, just like everybody else, just trying to figure out how I'm gonna do the thing that I wanna do, which is make film. So I was doing short films, and I just always thought about something that my, uh, one of my professors at film school said is just, you know, uh, to clean it up, because this is far more vulgar, was, you know, making work for yourself that no one else sees is like, you know, just sitting in a closet with it. And, uh, you know, it was like, how do you, how do you make a platform for, for people to see? And this was the early days of YouTube before, you know, many people were doing many things with it. And we started doing short films, and it was starting, that was back when, like, YouTube would feature stuff on the front page, which they don't do anymore. Um, and it got some traction, and then uh, a friend was <coughs> telling me how discouraged it was that, you know, getting money for film school was next to impossible for a lot of people. And there wasn't much info out there at the time, as you guys know. Uh, Philip was just starting at the time even, and uh, there just was, it felt, felt like everybody was keeping everything close to the chest. It was like magician's secret. So we were just starting out, still very green, and we were like, you know, what if we catalog our careers from what we know now to, you know, what we'll ultimately hopefully become. And that's what ended up becoming Film Riot is, you know, creating that community and letting people follow us on our journey, watch our mistakes, uh, and do what we do. And then it just slowly but surely became what it became. Yeah, very mm -hmm. cool. Uh, Sam and Nico, what about you guys? Well, uh, it's a kind of ancient history at, at, at this point for us <laughs> because, like, we, we were making, like, the style of videos you see on our channel, like these two, three minute like video game VFX action scene inspired pieces like we actually got our start doing that when we were like 15 years old like we'd been you know uh, making these like little videos and uh, posting them on a, uh, a site which is kind of like now known as hit film actually um, back then it was called LMDV but it was basically the small community of filmmakers who were into visual effects and so you know we uh, you know we kind of got our start making these like funny little action videos just Nico and myself and friends etc when going to college, obviously we had bigger aspirations and kind of slowed down on the, you know, make the two minute long goofy video. But suddenly like YouTube comes out and we're sitting there making these huge long form projects and, you know, suddenly like we kind of had that realization uh, that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of viable to do those kind of videos again. Um, like you can actually do something with it. And um, what kind of really sparked our, uh, our, I guess, our first first steps in that direction was actually starting to work with Freddie, um, because he uh, he had uh, some minor success on YouTube when we uh, first became friends with a uh, like a Guitar Hero video. You know, he was, as if everyone remembers, Freddie Wong is the world champion of Guitar Hero. <laughs> 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 but basically, he found viral success with the video um, uh, for for that, and um, basically, you know. We, we started pursuing that kind of after seeing some of that success and working with him and um, suddenly it started taking off for us as well. So, yeah. Seth, how about you? Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make movies since I was about nine years old and um, uh, an online video was not prominent when I was nine years old. Um, <laughs> so I grew up, though, what's interesting, I grew up, uh, my dad is a minister of music at a, a church in Nashville and uh, 
there we had a deck-to-deck -deck editing uh, bay that you had to strike in the right way um, to get the time codes to like line up weirdly. And when the power went out, the play deck would start recording when it came back on for some reason. Um, and uh, so I had access to stuff just to be making stuff. Um, and and then I started being able to make. Uh, videos for like the youth group and things like that, and but there, what that was was a built-in audience. Suddenly, people and weren't just wasn't just make, like Ryan was talking about. We're just making it for yourself. You're making it for an audience. Um, and so then, uh, as an adult, you know, I got a normal big person job making videos for like conferences and things like that. And then, I, and part of that was making these videos for uh, for these youth camps and kids camps. Uh, and I got to make a lot of narrative content there, and they kind of didn't care what we made because people kids already paid to go to camp, so they weren't going to make. This is when trying to convince people to come anywhere. And so we had fun with these. And when they were good, we put them online. If they were bad, they played at camp and no one ever saw them again. But they provided a built-in audience, which provided the pressure and provided the feedback and provided the, under, you know, the, the, the knowledge of whether or not we were terrible uh, and what we were doing. And uh, so Arne Rabinowitz uh, had seen like, some of my work. I'd used some of Red Giant's uh, software on them, in particular, particularly. That, would, that worked Pun out really well, well, didn't it? Yep. Um, Sing. Watch me do that in every answer yeah. somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he saw, he contacted me and said, hey, I love, I love what you've made here. Do you want to do a tutorial on it? Uh, and I'll give you some free software. And I said, yes. And uh, he went and saw a bunch of my old work from, uh, from my old job and all this narrative stuff and said, hey, I really want to make a, a short film to promote our content. And he mm -hmm. was very specific, very intentional from the beginning to say, I want to make a short film that doesn't feel branded, that, is, that feels standalone, and that can really just shows off our products. Um, and so out of that came our first short um, plot device, um, which we released in 2011, and uh, got really, really great response. Um, and since then, I've just been, we've been doing that at Red Giant, making short films to show off our software. Um, and uh, so with each short, we're trying to challenge ourselves with like, you know, we start with a product and how can we, what, how can we show off this product in a way that feels like um, it was extracted kind of out of an original idea, so. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so this is all about breaking the Hollywood mold and we've seen that uh, it seems like the gap between YouTube and Hollywood just keeps getting smaller and smaller every day, particularly I'd say in, you know, the past five years. What, do, what have you guys seen happen that makes it feel like that gap is continually to, uh, closing? Well, the, uh, te the technology gap is certainly the, yeah. the first, I think, and foremost uh, aspect in that, too. Just because, uh, I mean, the way Nico and myself shoot our videos is not necessarily how a, you know, a Hollywood set would run, but when it comes to a lot of the equipment, it's nearly identical. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we were talking yesterday, we were, uh, one of the topics that came up was distribution. And... You know, you can only break the Hollywood mold, mold, which you know it's known as Hollywood because it's reaching millions of people. You can only break that if you have another way to access millions of people. Um, and so it wasn't really until things like YouTube, Vimeo, and other like video services really took off, and hosting video online became affordable and honestly cheap enough that companies like Google could do it for free, that you saw this democratization of distribution. And so being able to go out and reach those millions of people just like any other business in the industry leads to sources of revenue and a way to support yourself and what you're doing. And you get a lot of feedback. <laughs> a lot of feedback. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Of, I'm, I'm with Nico on that one. For you know, audience is power. Community is power. And uh, you know, when you get that audience and it shows that it's viable in that way, Hollywood starts to take notice. I mean, uh, we're not Hollywood. It's a whole totally different you know path to an audience, which is amazing because it's a direct connection. There's no barrier there, um, which I love. You know, that instant feedback. You put something up and people are absolutely yeah. hating it or absolutely loving it <laughs> immediately, um, which could be good and bad, mostly good. Um, but I, I think that's the big difference, is like you said, that, that new distribution model and that ability to, uh, you know, go get that, that audience, build that community that will bolster you to the next level. And then they get ownership of it, weirdly. Totally. Because they develop this community and they feel like they're contributing to it by the constant conversation you're developing with the audience. Yeah. It's immediately accessible to you and you're more accessible to them. Yeah, and they kind of are, you know. It's like they've, I always talk about it like, uh, you know, we have an instructional show. Pardon me. <laughs> uh, we, we have an instructional show that's like, you know, teaching filmmaking and as we learn it. But they've also taught us a ton by critiquing our work. 
that constant feedback that you were talking about from the youth group stuff, um, you know, has made us better with each one. You know, they don't let anything fly. If there's a seam showing, yeah. they're telling us about it, which just, you know, makes us want to be like, all right, next one, they'll have nothing to say about it. Uh, so, so they do, they do in some way have ownership. That's a great point, and uh, I think that helps a lot too. And I think on YouTube, you're getting right now is a lot, not just YouTube, but on the internet, you're getting a lot of raw talent that you wouldn't get um, in Hollywood because, and uh, because honestly, you know, who's going to sink a million dollars into as raw talent as you're finding out there? And like, there's no barrier. There's way less of a barrier, a, a bureaucratic barrier to get it to the people. And so you're getting a lot of people's. Uh, vision and uh, like a lot of artists vision and an original idea is like s yeah. straight out of the gate um, which I think is really cool yeah absolutely yeah kind of, kind of another byproduct actually of people being able to watch your stuff and access your stuff easily is it's lowered the kind of quality that people expect to see and not in a bad way but oh, in a great way <laughs> no, seriously yeah well you know Hollywood is quote unquote Hollywood it's known for really high fidelity images really high fidelity sound and it's you know it's great but that's also a barrier to entry for a lot of filmmakers. Uh, you know, you can't go out and bust out like four boom ops, just get the whole room covered on top of your eight cameras that you're going to record with that are recording into 8K, whatever. It, you know, it just, it's not going to happen. But what that democratization of distribution with lots of people being able to make stuff and lots of people then being able to watch it, it's led to people accepting that you can still have good content without it being really high fidelity. And that's enabled a lot of people just to go out and make films because that level of distraction where you start to notice that it's low quality has been lowered. So people are very, very forgiving in that regard. So they're just very focused on the actual content, which is great. Because, yeah, like, my, my favorite movie Except is, for Jura audio. is Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. My, my favorite movie is Jurassic Park, and when that movie came out, it blew everybody away because their expectations were at a certain state because of, the, because of everything they'd seen before. And suddenly you see a walking, breathing dinosaur um, fully rendered in a computer, but they don't know that. You look at it and you literally go, I don't know how they did that. Yeah. Um, and that's what's so cool about making stuff on the internet is because there's still that, even though we now have the power to do that much, um, pe not everybody knows that. People assume if you release something you know, in Hollywood, they will assume that you're just pushing a button that puts tentacles on a man's face. Like it's a <laughs> right. what, tentacle button. And it's like, a button. And they, it's a fantastic button. Yeah. And we sell at redgiant.com very soon. <laughs> and, uh, and what's great is like, they don't assume that about us. They assume you know, that we have nothing, even though we have so much power now. Sure. And so it's really, really easy way to like impress people, make people go, how did they do that? Yeah, Which that's is a huge a, part of cinema. That's a really interesting part is because when we were looking through those reels, I think one of the things that you know, felt consistent throughout is there were a lot of weapons. explosions in there. Yeah, <laughs> explosions, laser beams. I thought it was elephants shooting laser beams. Elephants shooting eyes. lasers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, that's because we're young men. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, what, what role do you find, uh, what role does visual effects play in, uh, you know, in your storytelling and, and online video? I mean, for, for me, sometimes it's just fun to do. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I try as much as possible not to get wrapped up in that and more, you know, what does the story need and only do that much. Right. Because once it goes past that, it will start feeling excessive. But we kind of have, like, different things that we do. Sometimes we do stuff that's purely for entertainment factor, and then it's like make as much explode as possible. Just like, <laughs> you know, cups of water are exploding for no good yeah. reason. Uh, but then, you know, when we're trying to do more of the, the short film, uh, we're just sort of taking the story more seriously uh, sure. type of thing. Um, that's when I'm, you know, really sparing with it and as, and as little as I can show as possible, which, you know, is, you know, the, the shark wasn't working sort of idea. The less I'm showing, the less I'm doing, the more effective when I do show it and I do do. Um, did I just say do do? Uh, <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be that much more uh, effective. So that's sort of the idea that I'm always um, attacking when I'm doing visual effects um, personally. Yeah, I mean, honestly, for us, as you know, in, in our little reel up there, we have many effect shots and many videos and that's, you know, it's something we found is it's a great way to, you know, keep people watching something, great way to, you know, keep people engaged, but uh, it's, it's generally, like, not enough to satisfy someone's, like, desires for, like, wh whatever reason they came there to watch it, you know, it's like, it's no substitute for actually putting a story into your piece, um, but it certainly helps the story if you have one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a magician thing. It's a magician going on stage and doing a magic trick, but in video form. So it's that extra little bit of hook to get people to watch your video. It's that showmanship, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It also, I mean, you know, at this point, Sam and I are, you know, we're in Los Angeles. We're starting to get to know the people that can actually do explosions and get us blank firing guns. <laughs> but up until that point, 
there's no way to do that. So, you know, from pure practical standpoint, visual effects enable us to shoot the kind of movies we want to shoot. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was more or less Michael Bay style movies, <laughs> which, you know, not everybody aspires to do that. But when you're 14, everybody you're aspires like, to watch it. <laughs> well, yeah. But when you're 14 years old and you want to make a gunfight, it's like, well, can't get blink firing machine guns. <laughs> What's the next option? And, of course, your parents are like, eh. I'm not sure if this is a really healthy like pursuit. And you're like, trust me, it'll pay off. <laughs> You'd rather we shoot fake people. Yeah, and that's that's visual effects. That's where yeah. they come in. I, I mean, I, I grew up at the at the altar of guys like Spielberg and especially Robert Zemeckis. Um, I think one of the one of the one of the pivotal moments for me as a kid was seeing the making of Roger Rabbit on mm. TV and seeing the the scene with the penguin waiters um, with all the puppeteers underneath carrying around the like just on poles the the, the platters with the drinks. Full of liquid, all around this uh, uh, this uh, diner, but especially the scene with the uh, with the weasels holding the guns, like mm -hmm. the cartoon weasels holding live action guns, and and it's like an Invisible Man movie they're shooting, yeah. and like I I still just pull that out regularly and watch it because it's so cool, and I've uh, to me that's part of like uh, the the wonderful thing about Zemeckis is all of his films he uses visual effects in a way to. Um, it's cliche to say he uses them way to enhance the story, but he, he really like hinges the story on those visual effects, and and, and he he's kind of playful and, exper and uh, experimental with them, and so I, I think it's also a way of just creatively visual effects are a great place to just creatively challenge like they create really interesting problems. You're gonna have tons of problems on set making anything, and the more interesting problems you can create for yourself, I mean, problem solving, the cooler product you're gonna end up having. Um, plus, people really like explosions a lot, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, is, the, is the big budget Hollywood feature film still the holy grail for filmmakers, or would you rather create something that's maybe three to five minutes that reaches you know, 500 million people? What, what do you think is that, you know, is, is it still the feature film big budget, or is it? It kind of is, but yeah. it's not necessarily the, because of the size of the budget, it's just because it's the size of, it's the importance of the material, because you know, you have a, th the, the, the only thing, I mean, I, like, the only thing that gets a little bit exhausting making YouTube, like, content, is that each piece, while it can go out there and reach millions of people, and it's, like, it, 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 at the same time, it's, it's kind of less important, because they're, they're smaller, you know, they're like, uh, when it comes to a larger yeah. story, it, it has a greater impact on people when they watch it instead of just say, you know, two minutes of entertainment. And you know, we've loved the experience of being able to j hop from genre to genre and just like get experience doing tons of different scenes and different things over the few years. But but it feels like each piece doesn't have that same impact. You know, like I said, you you walk out of a movie theater and you're like, that was an actual movie. There was like 90 minutes of story. There was like all this stuff that was happening. Like you know, you, you treat it differently and you react to it differently and you also re remember it better, I think, than, um, you know, something you see online. I think he's exactly right. I mean, the, the excitement before a film, during a film, after a film, shelf -like life, like you said, uh, mm -hmm. that's the holy grail for me. Not like, you know, like you said, not budget, not big Hollywood budget. I mean, one thing that scares me is, you know, losing the control of, you know, your voice on the thing, which once right. you get into bigger Hollywood budget type things, that's an, an issue. But it's also harder to get that end result that you're really seeing in your head without that budget, being able to hire the people that can help you take it to that point that you want to. But mm -hmm. Uh, just, you know, long narrative, even episodic, you know, the Netflix model, anything like that where you're really sinking an audience into uh, a story and characters, immersing them into this <laughs> world to have this elongated experience is definitely end goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, we could all sit up here wax poetic about the, you know, with pretense about the shifting landscape of new media, but I mean, yeah. I think if you put a contract in front of me, uh, <laughs> the feature film is like a Seth-shaped <laughs> hole right back there in the wall. <laughs> And, um, but with that said though, I mean, I think at, several of us on this panel have gotten an email or a call or, or been asked by somebody, hey, you wanna make a feature? And your immediate, my immediate instinct is like, uh, no, unless it's a good one. Like, yeah. tell me what the story is. Like Ryan's, Ryan has asked me before, he's like, did you ever direct a superhero movie? And it's like, mm -hmm. and your instinct is like, well, probably not, but well, it just depends on what superhero it was. Right. And, and, and whether or not it, yeah. And so like, uh, it's, I think it's, it's uh, it is the Holy Grail for exactly 
uh, the reason that Sam's saying it's like a, it's, it's kind of the holy grail and it's, it's the importance of it and the shelf life of it. I'm just going to repeat what they said. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Uh, so uh, what's the definition of success for online video? Is it views? Is it subscribers? Is it, uh, you know, income? What, how do you guys define success for online video? Uh, I don't know about you guys. I, the thing I struggle with the most is that I feel like there's no failure right. in it. There's just indifference. There's just yes. people. That is, that is failure. That is painful. That's the worst. <laughs> like, it's like I would rather get hate mail. Mm -hmm. Hate exactly. mail? Who gets mail? <laughs> like, I would rather get the kind of comments uh, that we all regularly get than have nobody watch it. Yeah, because at least it was on the radar. I mean, if you inspired somebody to actually write a letter into you, then like... <laughs> <laughs> this guy really hated it. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing your right. video online. <laughs> the effort. <laughs> yes, sir. Not very happy. The URL listed below. Please discontinue your career. <laughs> there you go. I feel like we could talk about He's from the 30s, while. apparently. Yeah, this man apparently. <laughs> writes from the past. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, success is wildly variable, which I feel like you guys are going to say, too. It, you're trying to connect with people, and you can either really piss them off, or you can make them really happy, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's just when you don't connect with anybody, that's, that's failure. And, like, you know, some people getting 100 views on a video is successful. To other, getting a million is not successful. And, you know, so it... You can't really use a views metric and like you start, unless you start like nitpicking the details of whatever, you know, whoever's releasing yeah, the video. Yeah, it's also, I mean, how many views to how many people are working on the project to, yeah. you know, everything like, you know, a one-man job that gets a million views is incredibly successful, you yeah. know, and except like, <clears throat> let's say you had 100 people working on that project and it only got a million views, then, then it's kind of like, well, maybe, maybe you didn't do so well, like, if you had that much effort and energy and time going into it. Yeah, though I feel like... You know, all metrics aside, a measure of success on a film is not so much how many people see it. Um, it's more about does the film succeed in setting out what, it, what it's trying to do. Because you can have, like, there's films out there that I absolutely hate, but they are achieving what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Like, they're just not made for me. And I can much more appreciate a piece that tries to do something and does it, as opposed to a piece that tries to do something and fails at doing it, as opposed to whoever watches it, how many people see it, how much money it makes. Like, eh. Yeah. That all and, goes away. And personally for me, I think, and I can't speak for these guys, but 100,000 views is 200,000 views is a million views. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it just, once you get a certain, I mean, well, not a million, that's pretty big. But like, once you get to a certain number, it's just kind of like, to me, that success, I feel the success in the moments of like, when we get an email from a kid who recreated a plot device out of Legos mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I mean, that's, that's the cool like success uh, for me. Like seeing like the community Ryan's kind of cultivated and I've kind of gotten to be a part of that for a little bit and see the way that these guys like go out and they go out and they make stuff of their own because they saw stuff we made. Like, I mean, that right there is, that's the really cheesy answer, but it, it totally is true. <laughs> yeah, all of you guys do that kind of giving back to the filmmaking community, it seems. I've seen your shoot your friends videos that Corridor uh, Digital does. Um, <laughs> Explain. It's <laughs> bad title. Uh, Ryan, of course, has the Film Riot teaching, you know, all these sorts of do-it-yourself um, uh, things for filmmaking. Um, and Seth, as well, I've seen some behind-the-scenes videos of the things, you know, the projects that you guys have worked on. Um, why do you guys do that? Why is that, is that a, you know, it, are you giving back to the filmmaking community? Is it, is it um, something, uh, you know, you wish you had when you were, uh, you, you know, growing up? Oh, man, it's 100% something I wish I had when yeah. I was growing up. Like, when we were growing up, there none of that existed. The yeah. closest thing to it was, like, Movie Magic on the Discovery Channel. Movie Magic. But this is, like, you know, Independence Day. And look, this is how they blew up a car. And I'm right. like, that's awesome. You can't can do, do it. it. Yeah. You'll never be able to do this. And then my parents find me yeah. with a tank of gasoline being like, what's wrong? I'm filming it. Uh, I remember that exact episode, by the way. <laughs> really? This is my favorite episode. That and yeah. the cliffhanger episode would just repeat. All We're going to totally derail and just talk <laughs> yeah, about we'll movie magic. magic. Can we play a clip? Right, yeah. Forget, Forget the panels. <laughs> uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, what was the question? I remember the question. Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, I wish I had that when I was a kid. And, and more than anything, not so much as, hey, I'm giving back. Because we started when... Um, you know, we were brand new, and, and the idea was to put ourselves out there when we knew, you know, we were extremely inexperienced and starting from square one, which I think we kind of all did, um, and just tracking that. So it was more about creating a community that, I, you know, we were a part of, not that we were on this stage teaching these people down here, but we were just opening doors to this giant room that would hopefully, hopefully create this, like, you know, film club 
where we're all really excited, uh, excited about making a thing and we all come in and we're watching each other's work and critiquing each other's work and that's, that's what's happened. And that, that was always the main goal behind it, not to be like, let me teach you something because we didn't know that much when we started. We were figuring it out. Like that was the opener to you know, the original episodes of film writing. Like, want to be a filmmaker? Well, let's figure it out right. Right. Uh, together, not I'm going to show you. Because right. uh, you know, we're still learning with each one and that's, that's even my definition of, of success for every project we do is we learn something. Yeah. Um, people cared or didn't care, you know, or hated it, not didn't care, uh, care at all. But, um, you know, we learn something. It's one more step in, in, in the right direction. That's my main, like, definition of success, and that all that is the main reason I do it. Yeah, yeah. Also, also another byproduct of teaching people is that it's, it sounds a lot less noble, but by putting together a tutorial or teaching somebody how to do something, you reinforce the knowledge within yourself of how to yeah. do that. So if I learn how to do a, a crazy VFX thing, then it takes me, like, three or four days of, like, figuring out all these little intricacies and whatever program I'm using. If I don't do anything with it after that fact, I'll forget how I did it. When like, you know, a year down the line, I need to do a similar effect. And so taking the time to either make a tutorial or show somebody else how you did it is just reinforcing, you know, what you have just taught yourself and it gets it to stick. And not to mention it's when you leave the tutorial side of effects and all that stuff and kind of step more into the theoretical side of filmmaking, it's a chance to try to actually analyze and put into words those kind of instincts that you have when you're setting out to make something. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, like giving back, you know, quote unquote, is really a great way for us just to internalize things and figure it out and then set it out there and see what other people think about what we've tried to figure out. Yeah, I taught a class last semester and I learned more than I ever learned in film school. And it was stuff that was taught to me in film school. Uh, <clears throat> And I learned more of it because I had to teach it to people. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, that, that, that an analytic, yeah, analyzing it. You know, I think also, like, the first and foremost answer, like, yes, um, it's giving back. We, we grew up on DVD bonus features. I mean, and, like, making a movie magic first and, like, making of, like, the, the few, like, things that, that, like, Lucasfilm would do. Um, and, and then uh, it's, there's, a, there's a selfish reason, too, and that when you, if you do it really well and you do your job really, really well, people may not notice it. They'll notice like explosions and things like that, but sometimes you have to like erase a guy's arm or you have to like, you know, <laughs> do something like elaborate. Like I remember we had to like put a scar on a dude's face and stuff like that. And I remember it's like nobody watches or cares and you kind of want people to notice. And yeah. so, or you put a lot of hard work into something that looks so simple. And doing like a, doing like a quick tutorial or visual effects breakdown is yeah. a nice, humble looking way to show off how much work you did <laughs> <laughs> and get a little bit of credit. Oh, all right, all right. And I said it, that's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great, that's great. Uh, so you guys have talked a little bit about audience. What role does the audience play in um, you know, this online video stuff? So particularly, uh, you, know, you put something out there, you say you immediately get feedback. Obviously, uh, YouTube comment sections have uh, you know, some interesting personalities to them. Uh, how do, you, how do you, uh, you know, deal with all the feedback coming in? And, and then also, uh, keeping your audience's appetite uh, you know, for new content. Um, it seems like you guys very frequently uh, you know, release new content for them. I mean, it's the it, first and foremost. It's just you know that thing that keeps you doing the next thing over and over and over again. You know, for the last six years of us doing it, we we have this show and it releases on this day and this day, and people expect something, so we have to do it. There's no choice. So it's mm -hmm. it's forced us to be dedicated. It's forced us to push harder and bigger and more. And and so we've learned as much as we've learned and, and come as far as we've come um, because of the audience. You know, be, they're expecting this thing, and we have to deliver it. Plus yeah. that feedback that we get. Um, that we were talking about before. So uh, all in all, it's like exactly why we do what we do and how we're able to do what we yeah. do. Uh, just really quick, could, could I see a show of hands of everyone who has seen at least our videos or his videos? Anyone's stuff work online here? One person. Okay, so <laughs> apologies for talking about you guys all in, in third person. <laughs> like the audience, uh, yeah, we're literally true. our audience. <laughs> yeah, right. <We're, laughs> not to ignore you, They're but you know, the, the biggest thing too is, you know, when. When uh, you guys watch or if you like uh, comment on something, you know, you know, there's you, when, when people see that comment section at a first glance, you know, uh, not everyone's doing like a 500 word review of the video. You know, it's you know one word usually, or maybe like, you know, too spooky for me or something like that. You know, but even still, <laughs> that was me. That was me. It was too spooky. <laughs> but like, you know, sometimes like the thing is, is that even still. 
that one review, once you, when you read too spooky for me, you know, with two and four in the, in the words. Like, <laughs> no the spaces. thing is, is that like, there's so much you can infer still from that type of comment and that kind of review. And it's not, yeah, obviously, the 500 words, but the thing is, is that after, you know, reading this stuff, even if it's negative or positive, you know, it's, it's not so much about like what literally that is, but it's like what, what like signaled somebody, you know, what, what signaled you to put that one comment down, you know, and it's not like we can really quickly go, oh man, that was too scary, you know, but it's like, <laughs> where, where's that moment, you know, where that, you know, that, it, that it, something got referenced or like it sparked so, your, you know, reaction to post something and, and so, yeah, so it's, it's more about like finding, you know, this, this general like, it's not so much of like, you know, one single review that like totally blew our minds of like, oh man, this is what we should have done instead. Like we shouldn't, you know, it's more about like how people are reacting to different parts, how people are experiencing it and what's, you know, what's really kind of, uh, you know, sparking you guys to take that time, take the 10 seconds to type that and send it. So, yeah. It gives you a, a thick skin too, because you're constantly getting <clears throat> some rough critiques often. So you get like a really thick skin after a while to where it's, you know, it's always a little depressing, always, and you could get a thousand great comments and one bad and you're like, I am terrible. But it, it does give you a pretty thick skin, so it's, it's made it a lot easier to take notes. Like I'm always sending Seth my, my stuff and he'll give me notes and I, I don't want to throw myself off a cliff right away because, you know, you've been trained a lot to take the, those notes a lot better. So that's been a, a byproduct of it too, I think. Yeah, and you know, also the biggest thing we've learned is like just never engage in arguing on the internet. Yeah, never. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we did an experiment on Tempo, uh, one of the films that we released. <laughs> Where we really Where lashed we out We really at just like... We just laid into We yeah. looked into their Android. We sent them letters, mean <laughs> letters. Um, <laughs> we replied to their mail. Uh, it's sir. their mail. Yeah. Yeah. Double stamped it. Yeah. You, oh. sir. <laughs> did not appreciate the Maison Sin. Um, <laughs> I really wanted the rest of the panel on that voice. That's the most fun voice Let's to do. do yeah. um, I have uh, received the letter you have sent me about the URL below. It's Russian. And my response. No, it's Russian. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, but, like, I can't continue. That's so good. My brother does all the music for my films. My brother, Ben Worley, he stars in half of them. Because Ryan and I are both antisocial and afraid to meet new people. <laughs> so we use our brothers right. and everything. Um, we'll just start switching off brothers to confuse people. Right. You just threw um, me under the bus with you. <laughs> I know. Um, and uh, my brother does all the music. And on tempo, he did one of his best scores he's ever done. And, but it had a lot of... Um, it had a lot of the, what people referred to as the inception bomb, uh, yep. which is really just doing a lot of instruments all at once. Sure. <laughs> and... Somebody, a bunch of people on Vimeo were like commenting about, um, like, yeah, try not to do the Inception blah, I'm so sick of it. And, blah, you, no offense, if you're here, you have every right to that opinion. Yeah. I don't remember who it was. Yeah, could and, you? Exactly. and my brother just immediately wanted to like lash out and write letters and type things. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, he posted something and I called him and I said, hey, take it off, just yeah. try, watch this, let's just try something. Yeah. And the coolest thing ever was to see, like, within 15 minutes, a fan, another viewer, another fan, yeah. came in to defend the work yeah. with their own opinion. And it, and it wasn't like, yeah, we pitted them against each other. It was like, <laughs> it was like, it, it was like, it's a discussion. Like, someone coming in with, like, and saying, like, yeah. And, and, and they, and suddenly you have this discussion about film score and, like, and, like, and, the, and like, current film score and, like, and how, and, and trends and things like that. And it was like, and, and it was it, it, like it, it was just an interesting experiment to step back and to see uh, them all fight each other. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Sam and Nico, uh, you guys recently did this Patreon campaign, mm -hmm. um, and you know, you, so people are paying you per video now, uh, basically, and it's. Uh, so can you speak a little bit about that? That seems like kind of this crowdfunding is yeah. kind of a new frontier for online video as well. Well, actually. Uh, if you guys out there know uh, the Vlog Brothers or Hank Green, he actually wrote this really good article about uh, crowdsourcing and what he called the ask economy for filmmaking. Because when it comes to online video, it's the views that dictate your, your revenue. So a 10 second video that gets a million views and a 10 minute video that gets a million views get the same amount of money. Uh, it doesn't, <clears throat> getting into YouTube and making narrative films is the worst way for us to make money on YouTube. Uh, getting into YouTube and doing yeah. things that are easy to produce, like cooking shows, makeup shows, it, more or less just talk shows of any variety. Prank shows. <laughs> Prank video game while talking. Videos. Putting on makeup not, not, while talking. Not to put them down by any means, but the, at the end of the day, it's like, it is easier to make and cheaper to make. And, um, you know, an epic dragon 
isn't a, uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> kind of expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, one of the things that we experimented with was launching this Patreon campaign, which is still going, if you guys want to check it out. Um, <laughs> not implying anything. Um, so what that let us do is basically reach out to our fans, and you know, we weren't sure we have three point something million subscribers, but you know, there's a question of how many of them would actually be willing to pay a dollar for a video? Yeah. Um, knowing that they're, they're there and they're free, they can watch it anytime they want to, but who out there is like, you know what, I actually really enjoy these pieces of work, and I'd actually like to con contribute and help them make them. Um, it's a little scary launching it at first, because we didn't know would we have like 150 bucks, or would we actually like get a couple thousand, which is really what you need to produce a video that has a crew of at least 10 people. Um, but it actually, it, it worked out, it was really successful. A lot of people generously supported us. And we did our best to uh, provide something in return. You know, we have like the high quality Blu-ray style downloads because seeing the, the actual like full quality versions of the videos versus the YouTube quality of the videos, it's actually pretty noticeably different. Um, we do actually take advantage of the nice equipment we have. It's just there's a barrier. <laughs> YouTube compresses anything smaller than like this. And it's just <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but it, it really like, it, it had this, interesting change for us where we weren't asking for favors all the time anymore and we weren't trying to like scrounge little scraps together. We could actually call people up, set a time to shoot, it was on the weekday, they're working for us that day and we could pay our crew and it was this really like interesting shift. Um, it also let us start to take that step where quarter digital started to expand to be just a little bit more than me and Sam. And that, frees, that now frees us up to start working on these next steps that we talk about. Going out and doing that narrative film or series or whatever it's going to be. Because to sit down and write and put all this stuff together takes a lot of time. And if we're out there also cranking on all the, all the pieces that you need to make a video, you just you can't do both at the same time. So it's been great. Our experience with Patreon has been great. Our experience with the people supporting us on Patreon has been fantastic. It's also that extra bit of connection with your audience. Um, mm -hmm you know that they're, those people are even more engaged. Um, you know, we do the live streams, the hangouts, so you get to really talk to them and really see what they're thinking about your work. Um, so it's just all around been very positive. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, what's, the one, what's the best piece of advice you would give to someone in the audience who wants to do the type of stuff that you guys are doing? I would say start shooting. Um, no, not bang. like that. <laughs> Down! <laughs> put that away. Put that away. Um, start shooting, but don't make them big projects unless you really want to. Like, don't worry about the content. Literally just make a, I'm going to say it, make a dumb little video that's 40 seconds long about you putting the milk in the oven or whatever. And just make it. We didn't, you know, whatever. That's, uh, that's the next video coming on our channel, yeah. actually. Um, but just make it and edit it and do the whole process and see what happens. Also, and then do uh, it again and upload then do to it again. Vimeo instead of YouTube because I think, you know, the thing is, is people can be turned off very quickly from the comments on, on YouTube. Uh, it's like, it's not necessarily the type of feedback people need. And also, in the early stages, you, you know, yeah. when you're trying to figure stuff out too, it's the problem is that, that YouTube view counter is certainly going to bug you because, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you can't compare your work to uh, other larger teams of people who have been doing it for much longer times. So there's simply no comparison. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I would recommend uploading them to Vimeo. Plus, they'll look better. Also, I'd say <laughs> participate in like a film forum. Yeah. Um, going onto YouTube and trying to get all your feedback through YouTube when you're just starting out is going to be very hard. Yeah. Go find some like-minded people on some sort of film forum, effects forum, whatever you want. And there, people will really dig into your work there, but they'll do it in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, like, like they said, just make something and then make something again and then again and then again and then again. Um, I always say you have to make like at least 100 to make the first good one. Uh, and a lot of people we were talking about yesterday is a lot of people just start off, you know, chasing those views and that'll drive you mad, like you said. And I think that's great advice about going to Vimeo because YouTube can be extremely harsh, whereas uh, Vimeo is far more kind. It's far more like a... a uh, film sort of community right. there, so mm -hmm. you'll get constructive criticism instead of, you suck, I hope your family dies. It's like, what? <laughs> what, my family? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it would be that. Don't expect that you're going to put your first thing up and it's going to be amazing. It's not. 
Don't expect to put your first thing up. It's going to get a million views. Possibly can if there's a cat in it, but it probably won't. <laughs> yeah. um, so just make something and then make it again and then make it again and don't worry about like, oh man, I'm 25 and I hadn't made my feature. That was something that plagued me for the longest time. And I'm like, I need to just stop thinking about that and just keep doing what well, I'm doing. Well, until you're 40, you can... Continue. And then, and then you're like, yeah, yeah. Really, really Scott was 40 when he made Alien. Really Scott was 40 when he made Alien. <laughs> and when I get 40, I'm just going to like, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm going to do. Then it's myself. over. <laughs> then it's over. I think, um, uh, I, I think, yeah, Ira Glass has a fantastic fantastic interview he did on, on, on YouTube, and people have like done motion graphics to yeah. this interview like a thousand times. Right. Uh, and it's so good, his advice is basically just to, when you're starting off, you're gonna be able to tell, you're hopefully gonna be able to tell that what you're doing isn't very good. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing, it means you have taste, and that taste is what got you into what you wanna do. And that the more you do make things, the closer your skill set's gonna be, get to your, your taste. Um, and and that's what will carry you. And the, and, and the trick is just making stuff as quickly and as much as possible. And I think that, you know, something that I, uh, what drives me nuts about some people is, is the kind of a self-satisfaction and then they'll f make something and they'll think that it's so good and they don't need to go anywhere from it and they can rest on their laurels. And it's like, no, even if you're Steven Spielberg, Robert Zemeckis, like you don't rest on your laurels. You release, you know, Jaws. And then, you, and then you're, not, you're, in, and you're not satisfied. You, want more and you make more. And I think when you're starting off, before you're Steven Spielberg, uh, when you're just, you know, kid, you just like have to make as much stuff as possible and have as much fun as you possibly can and people are gonna find it. Yeah. yeah. And you're gonna find your, you know, your voice in the midst of it too. Yeah, yeah. Also super cliche, but don't worry about your equipment, except your audio equipment. Worry about your audio equipment. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Don't worry about your video. Shoot on your phone, doesn't matter. Just as long as it feels right, it has energy and feels like exciting. I mean, I still have stuff that I made as a kid yeah. that I still like. I still think is pretty awesome. <laughs> like, <laughs> like stuff, I yeah. literally like include it. Like I want to include it in my IMDb filmography, like Earthquake <laughs> Three. Yeah. Like you know, like that's yeah. like I'm I'm proud of several action sequences in it that we yeah. pulled off with like a digital A camera, and I have no right to be proud of them. But it's like yeah. just because it that he feels made exciting. Prime video you did is, uh, oh, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So really good. good, really good. Those uh, guys actually have their first film. Yeah, we released our first video we ever made uh, as, for, as friends, and uh, we just put it up on our YouTube channel. It happens to be a Star Wars one. And also happens to be 25 minutes long. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an epic. Awesome. It's like a fan fiction to the max, and we're all like 14 in it, and we, we can't act or shoot. or The only thing we can do is lightsaber effects. <laughs> the logo at the opening is pretty awesome, too. Oh, yeah. Thanks. We made a logo, and then like put the twist modifier yeah. in 3 yes, Max. Right. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend you guys check it out. Very yeah, cool. it's highly <laughs> embarrassing, but also really funny. Yeah, it'll show you what 14 years of filmmaking can uh, can do, <laughs> how far you can come. <laughs> uh, so, what's next for each of you? What's what's on the horizon for uh, for the next year or so? Well, I think we're taking uh, Nico and myself are taking our first steps into some much longer form stuff, um, and that's including some like 30 minute like. 30 minute like long like mini series kind of stuff that we're going to be releasing in the next um, two months or so. And uh, actually our one of like I, I guess our first feature in almost like three, four years. So um, yeah, fingers crossed on that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean at the same time it's the challenge there isn't so much of like, oh, we got to make a feature film. It's like, no, we got to do that and we need to make this YouTube channel we've been running for the last five years better than ever um, because we're making this feature, you know, for the audience that has been watching our stuff for years. You know, it's like all the, and the last thing we want to do is like lose that, you know, lose that vision, you know. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what we'll be up to. <laughs> uh, currently in the middle of a, a three month event that I'm doing with Seth and, and Andrew Kramer. So that's what we're doing right now. Uh, just three filmmakers making a short and then showing how we did it. Uh, and then on the horizon, very similar to these guys, you know, figuring out how to take our channel to the next level while behind the scenes working towards that end goal of long format, you know, works and figuring out what that looks like. But also getting into more uh, larger scale short films so we can start showing the the higher end and DIY end of the exact same thing. Like here's how you do it with this much money and here's how you do it with absolutely no money at all. Um, so finding finding the balance of those things while in the background uh, working towards you know that end goal. It's a little too early to reveal some of the stuff that we're doing. We have in the works at Red Giant, um, which is a shame because I'm really excited. 
about, about a lot of it. Um, what's interesting is we kind of, our, our story is kind of backwards compared to guys like the court, like Corridor, because we're, we kind of have been making, we started with these medium sized films and narrative, you know, narratively structured films. And then, and now we're actually starting to like, okay, we, our channel needs more stuff. And we have a lot of small ideas and things that we want to, we want to be kind of filling that content. Because we have to have much consistent content and it's hard to maintain, but we have, we have some stuff we've already, start, we've already begun working on and producing and we're going to start moving in that direction. While at the same time, we have some really cool big ideas that we're, that we're starting to move toward as well. So basically my children won't see me for um, <laughs> the next several uh, years. Um, uh, but yeah, that's the vaguest answer ever, but some really cool stuff is coming. Very cool, we'll be on the lookout for it. So we have about nine minutes left. Uh, if anyone in the audience has questions, uh, you can go use uh, one of these mics that are in the middle of the room, and uh, we'd love to, any questions for any of the panelists in particular, or everybody as a whole, yeah. Sure. Go you, for it. Can you use the mic back here? Just so everyone can hear you. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I'll just watch you walk over there. How are you? Oh, oh, in the back. Right, two mics. In the oh, yeah. All right. Test, back. Right. Let's do the guy in the back first, and then we'll, okay. we'll get to you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, how do you first start monetizing your videos, and how do you get funds uh, for starting your 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 not your first, but your first uh, money? How do you get it? How do you get money? Well, we were doing well. We start. <laughs> we, we started. We we were like uh, working as freelance visual effects artists. So that's how we, we uh, could afford, I guess, you know, not making money for like a little bit, basically by saving up and kind of preparing ourselves to dive into YouTube. Um, but since then, YouTube AdSense, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> Google will pay you for your videos. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, obviously, you know, crowdsourced stuff, Patreon. Um, and then uh, also uh, finding people to work with, such as sponsors or things like that. Um, that's, that's certainly something we've been utilizing over the last year or so. Yeah, but like initially starting out was saving up money, working a job, and then quitting that job and making YouTube stuff full time and not making any money and just hoping that we could get the exposure and the audience we needed as quickly as possible to the point where we could support ourselves off the ad revenue, which took us about... Yeah, we could have failed at that. It took us about three months to make that gap. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty much the same thing for me to start with. I had a full-time job plus uh, what we were doing online. So it was really like two full-time jobs. And uh, even with Film Right, you know, we're, it's all coming out of our own pocket. Any money that we make back from what we're doing, it, that's the money that we're putting towards our next production. Mm -hmm. um, and before all that, it was just, you know, well, well, let's put it on a credit card. That's the best idea ever yeah. because short films make so much money. <laughs> oh, uh, we'll and pay you know, us back when we get paid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And now it's, you know, it's a matter of finding sponsors that make sense, not just anybody that you bring on, just uh, people that make sense for the project that you're doing. You know, I like to go out for companies that I'm going to be showing their stuff anyway. So I don't even call it sponsorships. I call it collaborations. Like, hey, do you want to be involved with this with us? We're going to show your stuff anyway. We're doing this a either way. And just being honest like that. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, they get pretty excited about it. They're like, yeah, let's do a thing together and make it as... Um, because we possibly can. That, that sort of model that we've been going after lately. It can be really easy to kind of like vilify sponsors as well, but the totally. truth is there are so many companies and people out there that are fantastic to work with and like love your work and want to support it. I want to dive into it. I mean, Red Giant is one of them. They don't just, we don't just make our own films. We also support several filmmakers like Ryan and a lot of folks. And we, um, uh, you know, at Red Giant, the, the software pays the bills. Thankfully, so there's not a lot of pressure on our films to perform at all. So, I mean, we don't care what you guys think. Um, <laughs> Easy. Cool. Yeah, that really wasn't an answer to your question. So, uh, if, you could, if you can create a, a business that makes like, software, then provides the funds, and then you can make films. That's, what that's he's the saying one is the make yeah. plugins. Make plugins. Super. Yeah, easy. Go yeah. ahead. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so, I don't have any skill in making software plugins. <laughs> um, but kind of piggybacking off that question, getting your stuff on like Amazon or iTunes or Netflix, is that something you guys see is, has value? And if or if not, how do I get my stuff on there? Is there a way to get it there? Does it pay, does it you know, help you supply your next video? Um, have you guys ever looked at, have you done that? Yeah, well uh, uh, Amazon and Netflix certainly want content right now. 
uh, they, his, I mean, as you can see by the amount of original series they're even making on their own. Um, iTunes, on the other hand, is, I think, certainly a little more accessible for most people right now because it's a little easier. Um, there's more, it's more of a system set up to allow people to effectively just put stuff up on there and you get a link and you can sell it, you know. Whether or not you get front page iTunes time, that's a whole other thing, but, you know, it's a lot more accessible to just put your product on iTunes and sell that. Um, Netflix and Amazon, it's a little bit of kind of like you have to convince them, you know, because it's, it's more about the, the meetings and actually physically face to face, like making a deal with someone there. Um, that's kind of how that process usually works. And, we're starting to try and dabble into it because we're, you know, we're, we're ex we want to explore all these other um, aspects. But yeah, Netflix and Amazon are certainly um, not quite accessible for the average person right now. Yeah, and they're all looking for original content right now. That, like they want to find you. That too, but e but even for acquisitions and oh, stuff yeah. like that, you know, it's it's still it's it's still a very, you know, top tier kind of like Hollywood thing that we're we're even trying to grasp at. It's it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Ask us in a few years, we'll have some answers yeah, for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the challenge you're gonna face is just like any other media project, which is exposure. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a reason there's advertising plastered everywhere for movies that are trying to convince you to go see it and pay for it. So if you put your work on iTunes, you have to you have to cross that gap. If you're, trying, if you're expecting to make money off of that, where's your exposure gonna come from? How are the people going to know that it's there and how are they going to know that they even want how are you know to see it? And sometimes yeah. I ask myself, like, if they didn't advertise that there was a new Fast and Furious movie coming out, if they didn't make any posters, would anyone have seen it? You know, like, it's just someday you go to the theater and like, wait, is, is that another Fast and Furious movie? Should we see that instead? And it's like, no. <laughs> 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 but yeah, yeah, marketing. Yeah. Go ahead. It's working, yeah. Um, my question is about discoverability. Um, I noticed that everybody talks about gathering fans before uh, making the project or doing, but uh, the question is like, okay, what happens to most of us who already have a project out there, who have a film on our own website and selling to all these different platforms, um, you know, and how do you get found uh, when, you, when you already have the project done? Well, hopefully, hopefully you have a trailer that's really intriguing and is inspiring people to share it and show it to each other and say, hey, check this out, what is this? Mm -hmm. um, we kind of had, the, had that experience with our very first feature film where we cut a trailer. It actually just went on Sam's personal YouTube channel at the time. And it was really weird because suddenly it started getting views and people started like seeking it out and sharing it and being like, what is this? Um, you know, the, the discoverability for like YouTube videos is different than discoverability for movies. Actually, trailers tend to lend themselves to people sharing them actually pretty easily. Um, whereas a regular video just online, needs to be a certain type of video for people to share it. But you know, if you have, if you have like you're saying, if you have like a, a movie up on a site that you're selling or something like that, you really just have to kind of try to get your media out there that get people intrigued into like what that movie is. Uh, whether it's a really amazing trailer or some really cool highlights that you're putting on uh, either social media networks or YouTube or other places that will really get you some of that exposure. Uh, blogs and film making websites are another great way to get that stuff out there, but you gotta kind of home grow it and if, if people, if it's not generating buzz, um, then you just gotta kind of look yeah. at what your material is. It's, it's basically, you know, it's, it comes back to the marketing thing. You know, it's like paying for marketing is one way to get your product out there. Or if, if that's not possible, you need to rely on other people to do, the, to do that for you, which comes back to finding and making that shareable product, you know, whether that's a trailer or a scene or something that's like, hey, this is really cool, you know? Everyone's probably seen that, uh, what is it, that, Space whale sci-fi piece that was just <laughs> just came out, you know, you know, you yeah. know what I mean. Moby, Moby Dick, Dick in like, space or whatever. Oh, right. Like people have seen that, and the only reason they saw it is just because like it was short and it looked cool and it was shareable. It's like, whoa, what the heck is this? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this, you know. Yeah. You Hitch put it on Facebook, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hitchcock used to has a saying I think that was like. Um, uh, the um, um, a movie should only last as long as the human bladder um, can, you know, do what it does, and. Uh, and, and I feel like, for at least for me, I can't speak to these guys. I feel like for me, I'm constantly thinking about, okay, this film needs to be short enough to, for uh, people's boss's bladder, before their boss gets up out of their office and walks past their cubicle. Like, you need to be able to watch it as fast as possible and then share it. Um, otherwise, it's too long. Mm -hmm. And then I also can answer a question. Like, I think if you got one project and you're trying to figure out how to get people to look at it, it's like you're putting too many eggs. You might be putting too many eggs in one basket. You need to make more projects. Um, I know a, a lot of guys out there who have made their longer projects and released like a web series first, and then they developed a following from their smaller stuff, and it brought attention back to their old, back to their old projects. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it just comes down to quantity of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with all of that, and um, just being a part of community. Watch, comment on other people's stuff, yeah. and they'll come and watch and comment on yours. Don't just be in the corner begging people to watch your stuff. Also, go and be a part of other people's work. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, the big red light is blinking here. Oh, so. but he's, he's right there. Thank you. He's, oh. he's got it. He's you know, been, all right, he's go for ready. it, buddy. He's go been for sitting it. on it. Yeah, one. you know, go for it. You're right. Um, <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, assuming that one or all of you someday would like to work at the Hollywood level, has what the content you've been putting online been effective in getting meetings with agents, managers, producers, that kind of thing? And have, like, yes. maybe you could discuss strategic about that or how to be proactive about it? I can yeah. say what not to do. Well, it, it, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it gets you in the room, but it doesn't, like, convince anyone <laughs> to do anything. <laughs> you can do so much damage like, in the room. Like, that was a cool three-minute video, like, you know, and, and then you're like, well, I can do, like, maybe a 30-minute or maybe a 90-minute one. They're like, no. No. <laughs> it's like, well, all of them combined is, like, three movies, you know, I've technically, and they're like, no, it doesn't count. You yeah, know, so it's, and you, I mean, get, you get this feeling of they're like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> this kid. never mind. It's it's enough to get them interested for sure, but you have to have something ready to show that they don't yeah. care about that video. They care about what do you want to do now. So you have to have a pitch ready to go. You yeah, know, if you don't, it just that slows you're sitting down. On, Our biggest yeah, mistake is not bringing pitch. scripts to those meetings. Yeah. Absolutely, because <laughs> we're like we're like, oh, dang it, we're already in the middle of making three other yeah, videos. Their, their like, question is going to be, well, what do you want to make now? And that's the hard thing is if you're doing what we're doing, like you have a way you have an avenue to make any idea you get. And so if you get an idea, you want to make something, you go, you make it happen. Exactly. And so there's not like a big box of ideas that you're not making, except the bad ones. So when you get into these meetings, like you have any ideas? And you're like, oh. Uh, and you start telling them the worst ideas you have, and you're like, I am a failure. I am nothing. Um, my, my, my little personal piece of advice is when you go to these meetings, they always want to know what your favorite movies are, what kind of movies you want to make. And there's a, you're like sweating. You've been waiting in the parking lot. You got there 30 <laughs> minutes early, and uh, and you're staring at like the 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 ET sign on the Amblin like thing, <laughs> and you're like Steven Spielberg could be in here. Steven Spielberg could be in here. And you go and you sit down in the meeting. Like, so what kind of movies you want to make? And I just forget every movie I've ever seen in my entire life, <laughs> except <laughs> Twister. I, for some reason, Twister stays. And I think, I think, okay, I'll just talk about Twister. Twister. I'll talk about Twister until my, I remember all the other movies I've I seen in Twister my life. I want to make Twister 2. And then that Wait. never happens. I don't remember. And so I leave that meeting being the guy who talked about Twister for an hour and to an executive like, at DreamWorks. Maybe not. And they're like, and I know you don't get called back. So just brush up on your favorite movies and why they're your favorite movies before you go to these meetings. I got and also script. check out it's Twister. It's a fantastic film. <laughs> <laughs> and and be, be ready to pitch. Twister. Pitch whatever that idea is to your friends. Because once you get in that room and you haven't pitched before, it's really intimidating. And you try to pitch something, you're just, uh. And, and then the guy, and he has a gun. So just pitch to your friends. Because that's the exact same thing Please as what it me. is. Yeah. It's telling your friend and getting your friend excited about this idea that you have. That's pitching. Uh, that's it. If you get in that room, you know, even if you don't have a script, you might not be a writer. That's fine, but you need to have a treatment of some kind. You well, if, you want, if there's something you want to make, idea. the yeah. script is kind of and like the only one. thing you, yeah. Yeah, have like a list of here are the types of things that I want to make. This is what I'm excited about. Just really good concepts, and they'll pair you with someone if they like that. And, and bring don't visuals. Be discouraged if it doesn't yeah. go anywhere. There's a lot of things you can bring, but the thing is, is that if you the script is the blueprint for whatever you want to make, and if you come in and say I want to make something really crazy, they're like. <laughs> I kind of get it, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. if you have a script, you're like, look, like, this is what I mean, you know, and they can read it. Um, that's, yeah, it's, it's really important, actually. Bring some pictures, it, bring some art. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then you won't get it, you may not get any work, but you have a contact then. And keep checking mm -hmm. in, and you have people to send your next project, and you make, like, hey, check it in, check out this new thing I made. Yeah, because if they cared enough to bring you in, they'll care enough to watch you continue. Yeah. 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 They right, also thank count you. how long it takes for them to get to the room to bring you in. A lot of times they'll be like, oh, he'll be with you in just a minute. And exactly 10 minutes later, they'll let you in. It's like plot device is about 10 minutes long. They just watch plot device. <laughs> <laughs> before I went in there. All right, well, thanks for the extra time. Oh, of yeah, course. Perfect, thanks. no problem. Thank so uh, thank you. Let's hear it for our panelists. Hold <laughs> <laughs> on ourselves. Hold on us. <laughs> and thanks for coming out. <laughs>